Ladies and gentlemen, a, a very good point to you, uh, to the University Church and to these uh, Pantheon Lectures. Uh, my name is Martin Percy and I am the uh, Chair of the Pantheon Lecturers uh, Selection Committee and also a member of the Faculty of uh, Theology and Religion. And it's my uh, pleasure and privilege to introduce you to this uh, series of lectures this year taking place today uh, and also uh, the week today. Uh, I will say a little bit more about our speaker this year in just a moment. But I uh, wanted first of all to say that the uh, Bandon lectures at the University were funded by the request of John Bandon uh, in 1780, and they've taken place uh, ever since then. Uh, although in the 20th and 21st century, uh, they have been typically uh, biennial. And uh, the speaker, who will need no reminding of this, uh, receives his fee or her fee uh, only on receipt of the printed or published version of the lectures. So if you do lose the thread, you're pretty well guaranteed uh, that you'll be able to pick it up at some point later in a, a published form. Although I do have a very small list of Bantam lecturers uh, who failed to uh, produce printed text uh, some years uh, ago. Uh, too late for them now. You may be interested to know that uh, there's uh, a wonderful uh, and to some extent rather eclectic range of subjects that Bampton lecturers have covered in the past. These include uh, the doctrines of Unitarians explained, the communion of saints, the limits of religious thought, on Sunday its origin, history and pre present obligation, and then one of my favourites, the absence of precision in the formularies of the Church of England. It's probably almost nothing to say about that, I would have thought, um, but there we are. These uh, lectures, there'll be two this morning. Uh, there'll be a coffee break in between, which uh, we'll announce uh, at around about uh, 11 o'clock. And then uh, for those of you who can, uh, there will be uh, a more seminar style uh, this afternoon, which is uh, a slight departure from the way we've done these normally. Uh, which will give people the opportunity to engage uh, more in more depth with uh, our speaker, uh, Peter Harrison. So let me say something about uh, Peter Harrison. He's an Australian Laureate Fellow and Director of the Institute for Advanced Studies in Humanities at the University of Queensland. And previously, uh, known to many of you, he held the Andreas Idrios Chair in Science and Religion at this university and also served as the director of the Ian Ramsey Centre. He has published extensively in the field of intellectual history with a focus on the philosophical, scientific and religious thought of the early modern period and has written more generally on the historical relations between science and religion. He is the author of more than 100 articles and chapters and his eight books include The Bible, Protestantism and the Rise of Natural Science, which was published uh, 20 years ago now by CUP, the Cambridge Companion to Science and Religion, the Territories of Science and Religion, based on his 2011 Gifford Lectures, and most recently, Science Without God? Question mark, rethinking the History of Scientific Naturalism. And that's just been published by Oxford University Press and will be launched along with Alistair McGrath's book, this coming Thursday. It's very good to welcome Alistair here uh, as well, and that will be at the Mathematical Institute. The format for this morning will just be uh, two one-hour lectures, but uh, after around about 45 minutes, uh, there will be an opportunity just to do some uh, quick questions and engage, then, as I say, a coffee break, and then lunch in the chancel to follow. But I wonder then if you could join me in welcoming our distinguished Bampton lecturer this year, Peter Harris. Well, thank you, Martin, for that, uh, that generous introduction. I should also thank the, the uh, electors of the, the Bampton Lectureship for, for choosing me for this honour. Uh, and I'm particularly grateful to Will Lamb, the vicar of uh, St Mary's, the University Church, for uh, providing such a wonderful venue and indeed uh, for providing uh, the refreshments um, that uh, will follow these lectures. Uh, as you will have ascertained, there's a slight change of format of the lectures from previous years. Uh, the committee decided that after 230 years or so, it wasn't too soon to change uh, the traditional format. Uh, 
And so we will have two lectures this morning. This afternoon, there will be some uh, formal input, but there will be more opportunity for interchange and, and Q&A. So if you don't have time for questions this morning and you're coming this afternoon, hold them over, and I'm hoping that we can have a more broad discussion uh, in that context. But let me begin, uh, and we're talking this morning, as you can see, about supernatural belief in a secular age. In his famous argument against belief in miracles, set out in section 10 of his inquiry concerning human understanding, David Hume gets to the heart of the modern problem of supernatural belief. When we peruse the histories of First Nations, he says, we are apt to imagine ourselves transported into some new world where the whole frame of nature is disjointed and every element performs its operations in a different manner from what it does at present. It's strange a judicious reader is apt to say upon the perusal of these wonderful histories that such prodigious events never happen our days, in our days. Now this observation, I think, nicely encapsulates a common understanding of the differences between modern Western cultures on the one hand and traditional societies and our own medieval predecessors on the other. The world they lived in was a theatre that was constant, uh, subjected to constant incursions of the supernatural. People in the past saw God's hand at work everywhere. They experienced in the miraculous and they believed in reports of miracles made by others. They heard God's voice speaking to them, they encountered him in dreams, they witnessed angelic activities and the malevolent work of Satan and his minions. Uh, these are the kinds of things they experienced. But we, however, live in another world. It's a world governed by the laws of nature and the few residual unusual or unexpected events that we encounter are just that. They are not activities of supernatural beings, they are not divine communications or judgments, but they're simply strange events that are explicable in naturalistic terms, at least in principle, even if we might presently lack the knowledge to account for them. Now in this passage, Hume, I think, uh, presents us with what I think is a genuine puzzle. People in the past, seem regularly to have encountered the supernatural, and today we do not. They saw, they heard, and directly experienced things that, we, that now seem to be completely absent from our world. For Hume, the explanation of this was relatively straightforward. The events in question never took place, and the entities experienced are not real. As for any residual out of ordinary uh, happenings, uh, very likely, sorry, uh, very likely we now possess good naturalistic explanations for them. Furthermore, Hume believes that people in the past made up stories uh, and their contemporaries were overly credulous. More generally, supernatural beliefs are the mark of primitive societies and all civilised nations have rid themselves of irrational beliefs or eventually they will do so. Now, while we might now be more reluctant to speak in terms of the distinction between a civilised present and a primitive past, these explanations that Hume offers remain more or less the way we presently tend to think about the different worlds that Hume draws our attention to. Uh, and I've, as I've given you a clue, uh, more recently Charles Taylor has addressed himself to the same problem that Hume uh, has noted where Hume speaks of a past world in which the frame of nature is disjointed, Taylor draws upon Max Weber's terminology of an enchanted world, literally a world with the magic still in it. And he says, as you can see, uh, almost everyone uh, can agree that one of the big differences between us and our ancestors of 500 years ago is that they live in an enchanted world and we do not or at least we live in a much less enchanted world. Uh, and what made the world enchanted was, quote, forces could cross a porous boundary and shape our lives, uh, psychical and physical. Now, however, we have fortified the boundaries between ourselves and the other. We are, as Taylor puts it, buffered selves. 
Unlike Hume, Taylor does not think this situation has arisen simply as a result of a progressive process through which we have shared a complex of irrational beliefs about the natural world. Rather, as he puts it here, this has entailed a certain, a loss of a certain sensibility. Uh, that is really an impoverishment. Modern individuals have lost a way in which people used to experience the world. Now the question of how we came to lose this sensibility and how we might adjudicate between differing assessments of that loss as, representing, as represented by the opposing positions of Hume and Taylor is one of the main topics of these lectures. For all their differences, Hume and Taylor both rightly propose that this loss of sensibility was the result of a historical process. For Hume, the historical evolution of civilised societies from primitive ones. For Taylor, a historical process of disenchantment and secularisation. So one central focus of this, these lectures will be the narratives of historical progress and change although I will deal with, also deal with philosophical arguments for the supernatural. In these first two lectures, I intend to provide an account of the historical changes that Hume and Taylor draw our attention to. Uh, and I'll consider what this lost sensibility for the supernatural might look like and offer some suggestions of how we might have lost it. My general argument will be that some of the historical explanations that we presently use to account for our current situation are essentially myths, and they're myths couched in terms of questionable, questionable conceptual categories, and that these myths shape our understanding of the world in ways that are incompatible with the worldviews of our forebears. And I will begin... Um, as all good philosophers should, although I'm not a philosopher, with Aristotle, although you could choose Plato, I suppose. In a fragment of one of Aristotle's many lost works, fortuitously pr pr uh, preserved by Cicero uh, in his On the Nature of the Gods, we're, offering, we're offered the following myth, or as we might now say, a thought experiment. And this is a rather long passage, so... Uh, just excuse me as I read it out. And here it goes. Suppose there were men who had always lived underground in good and well-lighted dwellings adorned with statues and pictures and furnished with everything in which those who are thought to be happy abound. Suppose, however, they had never gone above ground but had learned by report and hearsay that there is a divine authority and power. Suppose that then at some time the jaws of the earth opened and they were able to escape and make their way from these hidden dwellings, uh, make their way from these hidden dwellings into the regions that we inhabit. When they suddenly saw the earth, the seas and sky, when they learned the grandeur of clouds and the power of winds, when they saw the sun and learned his grandeur and the beauty and power shown in his filling the sky with light and making day. When again night darkened the lands and they saw the whole sky picked out and adorned with stars and the varying lights of the moon as it waxes and wanes and the rising and settings of all these bodies and their course is settled and immutable to all eternity. When they saw those things, most certainly they would have judged both that there are gods and that these great works are the works of the gods." Now, the conceit of people living in a world beneath our own has inspired storytellers since antiquity. Much of the attraction of these stories comes from the possibility of drawing a contrast between ourselves and our underground counterparts. And the narrative usually pivots on the incursion of the inhabitants of one of these regions into another. The allegory of Plato's cave is perhaps the best known ancient version of this narrative and moving to here is uh, Plato's cave. Moving to the Renaissance, Dante's Inferno is at least distantly related to this genre. From the 19th century onwards, numerous works of science fiction deploy this motif. I'll just give you one curious example here. Um, by William, this is William Bradshaw's The, the Goddess of uh, Advatavar, 
And this recounts the story of a group of, group of explorers who were sailing south and they enter a vortex at the South Pole and find uh, an underground civilization of which we're provided with a map. Most recently, uh, Jean de Praal's 2003 novel, The City of Ember, and there's a 2008 movie of the same name with uh, Bill Murray, is set in an underground city built to protect its inhabitants from, a, from an unspecified terrestrial catastrophe. In spite of Ember's failing infrastructure, the mendacious mayor of the city contrives to keep the populace imprisoned in their subterranean metropolis by concealing from them the true circumstances of how they got to be there and by convincing them that return to the outside world would have fatal consequences. In fact, as we discover, the city of Ember was intended to be only a short-term refuge and return to the outside world had always been part of the plan of its original architects. The story ends with three rebellious young protagonists making their way back to the surface where they discover an Edenic world and experience for the first time the beauty of a sunrise, as we can see here. Now I'm going to come back to Aristotle in a moment, but I want to just say something about the City of Ember plotline, which offers a helpful way of thinking about one of the general theses that I'm going to argue in these lectures. And that is that we can think about our own modern predicament characterized by a lack of access to the transcendent as the consequence of being enthralled to a false history of how we got to be where we are. And because of our commitment to that mythical history, which consists in a series of misleading narratives about human progress and its connection to a purely naturalistic scientific perspective, we are unable to find our way back and more than this, we are unwilling to do so because we see it as a kind of regression. So part of what I'm going to be doing in these lectures is attempting to identify and dismantle some of these pervasive myths of modernity. And this might then give us a new perspective on our predicament and indicate a possible way out of it. And I'll be elaborating more on this uh, as we go along across this week and the next. For now though, I wanna come back to Aristotle the temptation for modern philosophically trained readers is to regard Aristotle's parable as a fairly standard presentation of a cosmological, or you might think a teleological, argument for the existence of the gods. That is to say, an argument from design or the regularities of the cosmos. On that reading, the intended contrast between the condition of those living in the subterranean caverns and left to rely only on report and hearsay, uh, and those who make their escape from that limited perspective and directly evidence the divine authority and activity um, is that uh, those who make this escape from this limited perspective are able to see the universe for themselves and thus equipped with an evidence base denied to those left behind uh, are able to draw the correct logical inference from what they see in the universe. But another way of thinking about this story is to imagine a different contrast being set up. One between those who've always dealt un dwelt under the sun but have lost their sense of wonder at the order of nature, essentially us, and the subterranean rivals who are immediately struck by features of the world that routinely escape our attention. And Cicero gives us the clue in his interpretation of these events when he relates the Aristotle parable. And there it is, from daily habit, our minds and eyes have become accustomed to this sight. We no longer wonder at it. We no longer seek a reason for something we have always known. And Augustine will later reprise precisely this view in his discussion of miracles. He says, quote, isn't the daily course of nature itself a miracle, something to be wondered at? Everything is full of marvels and miracles, but they are so common that we regard them as cheap and of no account. Now there are obvious parallels here with Plato's allegory of the cave, which similarly seeks to impress upon us the need to escape the illusions foisted upon us by our bodily existence in this material world and to spur us into a reminiscence of the eternal truths lodged in our minds. Later Stoic and Epicurean philosophers had a parallel notion 
that human minds have an innate preconception in their terms, they called it a prolepsis of God. This inborn sense of the deity they assumed to be universal, although it was conceded that this seminal God conception on account of various adventitious factors might not always rise directly to consciousness. Cicero's retelling of Aristotle's parable draws directly on this idea and thus is aimed at bringing to our minds this direct sense of the deity. Experiencing the reality of the gods in Aristotle's parable then is a matter of discernment and perspective rather than argument and inference. His primary purpose, uh, and, and this by the way I'll argue is a key difference between the approach of the ancients and the approach that we currently have today. Aristotle's primary purpose on this reading is not to present us with his own variation of one of the classic arguments for the existence of God. In this sense, Aristotle is less like William Paley and more like the Old Testament psalmist. Paley, as is well known, proposed that we think of the operations of nature as analogous to that of a watch and draw the inference that they, there must be a divine watchmaker. In contrast to Paley, the psalmist simply announces the heavens declare the glory of God. Sorry, I'm jumping ahead. This is the problem with doing the PowerPoint karaoke. Um, not quite keeping up with the lyrics. At any rate, the psalmist declares, the heaven, sorry, the psalmist says, the heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament shows his handiwork. Day unto day utters speech and night unto night shows knowledge. So the Hebrew hymnist doesn't offer up the heavens as a premise for a design argument from which divine activity can be inferred, but rather seems to be proclaiming what is directly evident. Similarly, Aristotle's cave dwellers immediately see that nature is under the superintendence of God or the gods. Indirect inference and weighing up of probabilities uh, in Aristotle's story was actually the resort of the tenants of the subterranean world who until their above ground epiphany had to rely on secondhand report and hearsay. That's the quote from Aristotle. Now the related ideas about an innate sense of the deity and directly discerning divine activity rather than inferring it was not restricted to ancient philosophy and we encounter versions of this idea until well into the modern period, so beyond the 16th and 17th centuries. And I've given you the clue already, here's Calvin on this. There exists in the human mind, he says, by some natural instinct, a sense of the divinity. This is in book one of the Institutes. This sense, he says, is indelibly engraven on the human heart. It's naturally engendered in all. It's a remembrance of God, spontaneously suggested by the natural sense. Now, while Calvin's chief inspiration for this is the passage in Romans that speaks about ever since the creation of the world, his eternal power and divine nature, invisible as they are, have been understood and seen through the things that he has made. That's the primary biblical source, but interestingly, Calvin also cites uh, directly Cicero, there is no nation so barbarous, no race so brutish as not to be imbued with the conviction that there's a God. In the century following Calvin, several prominent thinkers would continue to develop this idea. They included uh, the French Calvinist, uh, Moise uh, Amaral, who maintained that the existence of God was known by reason to every nation on the earth. On the other side of the confessional divide, his compatriot, uh, the French priest and philosopher Pierre Gassendi, reprised Epicurus' idea of a prolepsis or a preconception of God in all human minds. Several influential English philosophers also rehearsed this thesis. The first modern and systematic advocacy of the idea among English thinkers can be, can be found in Herbert of Sharbury's book uh, On Truth, 1624. And following him, a number of the so-called Cambridge Platonists would speak similarly of an in innate, a priori, as we would say, propensity that enabled a direct intuition of the existence and activity of God. So just to give you a few examples of these thinkers, Joseph Glanville, an Anglican clergyman, one of the first members of the Royal Society, maintained that, quote, there are inbred fundamental notices immediately lodged in our minds, independent upon principles and deductions, 
commanding a sudden assent or agreement and acknowledged by all sober mankind. By sober, he means rational here, not literally so. Henry Moore, uh, one of the, the Cambridge Circle, also in his book, An Antidote Against Atheism, drew a parallel between this recognition of the existence of, the, of God and the way we come to a recognition of the truths of geometry. I'm quoting here from Henry Moore. And therefore, if there were any nation that were destitute of the knowledge of God, as they might, as they might be likely of the rudiments of geometry, so long as they will meet of, admit of the knowledge of one as the other upon a due fit proposal, the acknowledgement of God is as well to be said to be according to the light of nature as the knowledge of geometry which they thus receive. That probably wasn't a very helpful quote to read out. What he's saying here is we don't explicitly know the truths of geometry, but when they're explained to us, we do come to an agreement, an acknowledgement of them, so too for knowledge of God. So Henry Moore here nods in, in, in the direction of uh, Plato's famous dialogue, the Meno, where Socrates teaches Meno's slave boy a geometrical theorem simply by well, using the Socratic method, asking a series of questions. And the idea here is that the truths of geometry are in some sense innate. They simply need to be brought to the surface. So too with the God idea. So another of the Cambridge gang, Ralph Cudworth, argued that, quote, the generality of mankind have constantly had a certain prolepsis or anticipation in their minds concerning the actual existence of God and the true idea of him. Cudworth spends many, frankly, tedious pages of his book, The True Intellectual System of the Universe, collecting ancient authors who, he says, argued precisely this. Now, from our perspective, one of the curious features of these claims is that they were not simply offered as anthropological observations. The universality and innateness of God beliefs was strongly urged as evidence of the truth of those beliefs. Common consent was the expression that was often used of these, and that was a principle that could be used to support a range of doctrines. And a, a whole a number of ancient authors, Plato, Cicero, Seneca, Clement of Alexandria uh, had deployed it to argue for the existence of God. Among 17th century writers, Herbert of Sharbury, who I've already mentioned, championed it, championed it most strongly. Uh, and here's the quote from Herbert. Universal consent must be taken to be the beginning and end of theology and philosophy. I maintain that universal consent, the fact that all nations agree that there's a God, is the last resort and sole test of truth. At the beginning of the 18th century, and remarking upon the prevalence of this argument from universal consent, Henry Lee agreed, and I'm quoting here, the first and most popular argument, which is generally thought for proving the existence of God, is the universal consent of mankind. By way of contrast, in modern philosophical discussions of the existence of God, this argument rarely rates a mention. Modern readers will typically regard it not to be an argument at all, or if it is, not a very good one. For a start, it looks like a dubious anthropological observation, and one that has been under challenge ever since Locke pointed out that there were nations of atheists. It's also difficult to incorporate into our contemporary classifications of arguments for the existence of God which observe a basic distinction between a priori and a posteriori arguments. Don't worry too much about that. Let's just say it doesn't actually fit the pattern terribly easily. If we think about, okay. Finally, I think these days, the naturalness of religious belief, if that claim were to be made, is more likely to be regarded as evidence for it being false rather than being true since naturalistic explanations of the origins of belief are often, albeit mistakenly, assumed to undermine the veracity of those beliefs. Evolutionary debunking arguments thus seem to attempt to explain away religious beliefs by offering stories about their evolutionary origins. So again, we have an odd situation. Even if we share this commitment to some putative fact about human cognition, that there's an innate God belief, 
we tend to place a diametrically opposed interpretation on it today to the interpretation of those in the past, both in the ancient world and in the early modern period. So one question that we're left with is how the status of this argument came to change from being what one writer called the first and most popular argument for the existence of God to being a historical curiosity that gets no airplay. How is it that the ancient and early modern philosophers found this innate tendency towards theistic belief to be a compelling argument for the supernatural? Now, before attempting to answer that, I want to look at one final example of a related kind of argument. The Scottish Enlightenment philosopher Thomas Reid grappling with the, the agenda set by Descartes, which sought to ground philosophy in indubitable or undoubtable foundations. Um, uh, in short, what Descartes wanted to do was to, to find a starting point for philosophy that didn't require any further justifications itself. Reid is still grappling with this. Reid thought, attempted to stop the business of an endless regress of arguments by stopping with what he called first principles. And here's Reid now. I love the hat. But the quote there, what he says about first principles is that the evidence is demonstrative. It's not demonstrative, but it's intuitive. And these first principles don't require proof, but to be placed in the proper point of view. In the case of the, the, the structure of the world, the ordered structure of the world, um, Thomas Reed, Adam Smith on the banknote, William Huell, the uh, 19th century Cambridge polymath, and um, yeah, I could say a lot more about him, but I won't. Uh, they, they seem to regard divine order in the world not as an inference, uh, that we draw from observations, but a function of how our minds naturally operate. And here's how William Huell expresses it. There are his dates. So when we collect design and purpose from the universe, we don't arrive at our conclusion by a train of deductive reasoning, but by the conviction with such combinations as we perceive immediately and directly impress upon the mind. It is not therefore at the end but at the beginning of our syllogisms, not amongst the remote conclusions, but amongst the original principles that we must place the truth. So what's he saying here? The world has a designed look to it. And if Reed and Huell are on the right track about this, a number of, uh, a number of things follow, a number of questions follow. How is it that things have this look about them? Are we by nature predisposed to, to see things in a certain way? given that individuals in different time periods and different cultures vary in their capacity to see the same features of nature, what accounts for this variance? Why don't we see the world as designed now? So what is it that modern critics of the design argument or the cosmological arguments are missing? Now it's tempting to, to think that Darwinism made all the difference here. That's the wrong way to look at it and I'm not going to argue for that now but um, I'll talk about that later. It's the story about Darwinism that makes the difference, not Darwinism itself. And so that's one of the stories that we need to pull apart and demythologize, which I'll talk about next week. Now, the questions raised by these approaches to knowledge of God from Aristotle to Reed and all in between lead me to a general remark about philosophical arguments considered from a historical perspective. And it's one that I've already been hinting at in a number of my remarks. When we dispassionately survey the history of Western philosophy, one of the most intriguing features of this long history is the way in which arguments that command broad, almost universal agreement in one period just fall out of favor and become thoroughly unconvincing and inconsequential in others. Now the argument for the existence of God from the innateness of a God belief and universal consent is a specific case in point, although there are a number of others. A simple way of accounting for this is simply to assume, unlikely as it may seem, that philosophy makes progress and that in the rise and fall in popularity of particular arguments, uh, there's a general direction of travel. 
and it's in the right direction. Right? That's the argument. Now, this is not an unreasonable position to take if we think that the arguments in, in question rest on new scientific facts, for example, or new philosophical techniques, um, and that these give us an advantage over our predecessors. And that would explain why arguments that were once popular are no longer. But another possibility, and this is the one I'm going to be plumping for, not altogether incompatible with the first, is that what makes certain arguments or stances persuasive is less to do with their internal logic or their appeal to universal and unchanging canons of reason than it is to do with the fact that people just see things differently in different periods. And this is a kind of standard view uh, from Wittgenstein that I'll come back to, an idea of seeing as. And this is Wittgenstein's famous example of the duck rabbit. This doesn't cover all the instances of seeing things differently, but it's one instance of the way people see the same thing as two quite different things. Okay. Now, this difference in perspective can arise in different ways. It might be about differing intuitions that the arguments are based upon. It might be about different categories and concepts that are used in the arguments. It might even be about what counts as an argument and whether philosophical argument is the right venue in which to determine the question. We know, as a matter of empirical fact, that people in different cultures and time periods ask different questions based on divergent background assumptions or cognitive predispositions. These background factors often go unnoticed, and only on rare occasions do they present themselves for consideration or assessment. This is not altogether surprising because the study of changing categories and concepts tends not to fall within the domain of philosophy itself, but within the domain of history. And widening our focus even further, the examination of how societies past and present approach core issues from different perspectives and with different conceptual frameworks is the business of cultural anthropologists. Now, we can't substitute history or anthropology for philosophy but I do believe these disciplines can shed uh, considerable light on what we regard as traditional philosophical questions. And the question of the existence of the supernatural and the varying plausibility of arguments about it are a case in point. Let me give you an example from the Cambridge philosopher Tim Crane, who recently wrote this uh, in the, the TLS. And it's a longish quote, so again, I'll, I'll, uh, you can probably read it for yourself, but I'll, I'll read it out anyway. Most philosophical problems have actually risen as a result of specific historical circumstances and contingencies. For example, because of the need to defend or articulate religious ethics, or from challenges from science, or as a result of speculations of other philosophers about the past, or paradoxes or conflicts in ordinary thinking about the world. So getting to grips with a philosophical question is partly a matter of understanding where the problem comes from. This is the key point. Getting to grips with a philosophical question is partly a matter of understanding where the problem comes from. And this requires us to think to some extent about the historical construction of the problem. Right, that's what I'm going to be talking about in these lectures. And to take seriously the deeply contingent nature of the philosophical tradition in which we find ourselves. So we think that philosophy deals with the universal. Actually, philosophy deals with the culturally specific and particular. And if we confuse those, we get ourselves into, into puzzles. OK. Now, my own previous work, if I can mention it briefly, my own previous work has focused on how the meanings and boundaries of key concepts that we presently operate with have changed over time, and how these concepts influence the conduct and scope of philosophical discussions that often escape notice. Religion is one of the first concepts that I began to deal with. Science is another of these concepts. Um, and because these concepts frame the discussion in particular ways, they actually shape the possible conclusions that we can get. Now, once we get a sense of the history of these concepts, how they came to evolve and how they came to emerge in specific historical circumstances, uh, we also gain a sense of how the historical actors themselves used them and used them in ways differently to the way we use them today. And without that work, 
We often think we're talking about the same thing that people in the past were talking about, but we're not. And this applies to a range of things like, and I'm going to talk more detail about these next week, but, but most important among these, conceptions of nature and the natural, and a range of contrast categories with nature. Natural supernatural, natural revealed, nature culture, and also one that I'll talk about this afternoon, belief and knowledge. We tend to think of these things as concepts that range unproblematically without changing their meaning through history, but they don't. And until we grasp that, we run the risk of completely misunderstanding what it is that people in the past were on about. And if we're part of a historical tradition, it's really key that we understand that. So I plan to adopt aspects of this approach again in these lectures, and the key concepts that I focus on, as I said, are going to be natural and supernatural, natural revealed, nature culture, and so on. These may seem to be relatively straightforward, but as we'll see, they are not. And just to give one or two indications of how this approach might work in practice, we can arrive at at least a partial resolution about a puzzle for why ancient and early modern actors, it was just obvious that the naturalness of belief counted as evidence for its truth, and that is the fact that what we now mean by natural and belief are different from what they meant by natural and belief, and that's how the puzzle comes about. Related to this is the natural supernatural distinction, which we often assume is obvious and universal, but which turns out to be a particular and specific product of a moment in Western history. And again, unless we understand that, we're not in a position to understand a distinction between the natural and supernatural and discussions about the problem of experiencing the supernatural in the present. Now, the differences in meaning between our present conceptions and those of the past, moreover, are not amenable to simple translation because they are the visible superstructures of deeper ontological, cosmological and anthropological commitments. And once we excavate these deeper frames of reference, we find out that we're not simply assessing arguments or even concepts, but we're attempting to enter into divergent worldviews. Now, this may seem to catapult us into the murky waters of incommensurable paradigms and the big bugbear of self-defeating relativism, uh, but it need not. And it need not because the relevant worldviews are, for us in the West at least, they're historically connected. And history provides us with, as it were, the trail of breadcrumbs that enables us to trace back uh, where we've come from and how we got to be where we are now. What gets in the way of this process, though, of seeing the evolution of these concepts are false histories that we construct about the past. Uh, and these divert us into pasts that never existed. Right? And they give us a distorted impression of how we got to be there today. And there's a range of these stories that dominate how we think about things in the present. The narrative of progress, the narrative of a conflict between science and religion, which obviously in the context of lectures about science and religion is the key, a key narrative. Another one that I'll be talking about in detail is the idea that science is naturally, is naturally, inevitably aligned with naturalism, okay? Uh, the story of disenchantment is also uh, one of these. So what we're going to do is to look at these false constructions of how we got to be where we are that represent a barrier between us and the past and see if we can, we can demythologize or deconstruct them. If we go back to the City of Ember scenario that we began with, for example, it was the fact that most of the city's inhabitants were persuaded by the false view of history propounded by the mayor that prevented them seeking extrication from their underground predicament. It was the young rebels' discovery of the true history of their city that enabled them to escape from their subterranean prison and return to the world from which they had originally come. Let me offer just one other way of thinking about this. If we take the presumption of historical progress off the table for a moment, we can attempt to view the past more on its own terms than ours uh, and try to imagine uh, what our present way of looking at things would look like to those, those in the past. If we imagine history running backwards, as it were, and our early, med early modern and medieval and ancient counterparts writing a history of our period, 
what would they say? Would they see this as a story of degeneration from a wonderful present that we're in to where they are now? And to some extent they might, because you can imagine all the wonderful technology that would have somehow been lost. But overall, um, I'm guessing they would not necessarily see the superiority in general of our way of looking at things over their own. To help us see why Hume regards the shedding of supernatural beliefs as progress and Taylor regards it as a loss of something, Taylor is looking at it from the perspective of a past. Now it may be a past that we cannot return to, I'll come back to that, but at least this gives us a sense of what it is about our situation that we think uh, is better than the past and science is a key part of that. Not regarding the present moment as the end point of a process of historical progress might appear to be a big ask, but we actually manage it in some fields of human endeavour, such as the history of the creative arts. So it's possible to take a cursory look at medieval art, for example, and conclude that people uh, in the Middle Ages were just lousy at drawing. Uh, two weeks ago, um, The Guardian was part of its long-running series that gets readers to send in questions. I know you'll probably all read as of the Daily Mail, but for those of you who read The Sun, sorry, not The Sun, The Guardian, those of you who read The Guardian, you might have seen this story there. Um, so The Guardian actually posed exactly this question. Why were medieval people so bad at drawing? Now, answers vary. Uh, one wit wrote in and said it's because they spend all their time, they had to spend all their time warding off threats from giant snails and thuggish rabbits. But the more reflective response would be they, they simply saw things differently from us, that their artistic efforts were directed towards different ends, their criteria for, for judging the success of a work of art was different at variance from ours. And we can ask the same question about indigenous art too. If these are not simply rudimentary and inept attempts to produce realistic representations of the world, then our questions might not go to what skills or competencies they lack that we have, but what their goals were and what they might be seeing that we are no longer seeing. And we can apply similar considerations to the history of music and, and literature. Now, the obvious response to these analogies is to point to the counterexample of science, and this is why science is key. Science and material progress look, to, look as if they're clinching arguments for the superiority of modernity. It would strain credibility to argue that modern engineering or medicine, the real clincher dentistry, are not superior to their medieval equivalents. Or to suggest that the geocentric model is just as good as the heliocentric model. This certainly looks like progress, although we need to bear in mind that the science that holds out the promise for cures for cancer has also uniquely given us the means to bring an end to our own world and in a number of different ways. On this point I'm reminded of the remark of the distinguished philosopher Michael Dummett who was for many years the professor of uh, logic here and a fellow of New College. He offered this interesting assessment of the benefits of physics, quote, what sane man magically given the ability in 1900 to foresee the nuclear weapons which it would make possible would not have opted if given the power to prohibit all future research in physics. Apologies to you physicists in the audience. <laughs> but anyway, that's what he thought. But let's grant science, let's grant science as progress for now. Okay. Um, in relation to the question that we're exploring, we can still ask what direct connection there is between scientific and technological on the, advance on the one hand and the modern loss of plausibility of belief in the supernatural. It's not immediately clear why there should be any connection at all. But the argument is, the myth, I would argue, uh, is that science has replaced religion, or that it's made religion unnecessary. And to, to quote Terry Eagleton, who's one of my favorites on this, this is a little bit like saying that now we have the electric toaster, we no longer need Chekhov. It's a failure to understand how the categories work. But the link between scientific progress on the one hand and decline in belief in the supernatural are so tightly bound together 
we tend to think of them as both necessary aspects of progress. From Hume onwards, then, there have been powerful attempts to align growth in the natural sciences with the decline in the plausibility of belief in the supernatural and to argue that both represent progress. And while this narrative is perhaps most conspicuous in the crude polemics of the new atheists, my suggestion will be that versions of this narrative continue to be all pervasive, even in forming contemporary theological discourse, in forming religious apologetics, and many of us in this room, I suspect, are enthralled to this notion itself. So to sum up, uh, this, the, sum up where we've come, it's very clear that there's something quite distinctive about how many of us in the modern West view the world, uh, and examples going all the way back to Hume and as recent as Charles Taylor established this. Because it is our perspective, we tend naturally to think it's the, it's the, it's the correct one but from the viewpoint of those in our long historical past, and indeed from the standpoint of other cultures, although I, won't, I haven't considered these, our perspective on God and the transcendent is odd and idiosyncratic. When confronted with these alternative viewpoints or vantage points, we counter that the superiority of our position arises out of the fact that it's the end point of a process of historical progress from a past that was burdened with irrationality and superstition to a relatively enlightened present, and the primary example of this progress is science. My suggestion is, and will be, that this confidence in the modern way of looking at the world does not in fact result from any genuine progress, but from a number of related narratives or myths of progress. These myths place a disproportionate burden on science, as the paradigm of progress and falsely implicated in an apparent decline in the plausibility of religious belief. These partial and misleading stories about how we got here also foster a strategic forgetfulness of key elements of our own history. The task then is to identify and demythologize these false narratives and remind ourselves of what has been forgotten. And in the next lecture, I'm going to take a closer look at David Hume, whose historical observations about religion and theistic belief offer a perfect exemplification of how these false narratives of modernity have arisen. Thank you. We have about uh, 10 minutes, I think, just for some uh, questions and uh, any observations. So, please happy to say that uh, there is a roving mic as well, which will come around. So, uh, I'll take one there. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, are you implying that uh, scientific knowledge that is used is, is intrinsically problematic? dangerous human beings. Presumably you're not arguing that we should all live in the stone age still. And secondly, you are clearly admitting that historically and at present religious people who I am not um have no evidence or proof for God. Yeah look um let, let me take the first one. Um, no, I'm, I'm not getting down on science here. What, what the, the point of the exercise for me is to explain how science has been implicated in a range of false stories about progress and modernity, and in particular, how science relates to religion. So this is not an anti-science rant, although I do think we need to be realistic about the dangers that, that what science and technology have presented us with, and I go back to the point, you know, we, are, we are now arguably at a moment in history when for the first time we have the capacity to, to destroy our own planet. And to think, to think uh, uncritically about progress is, is to forget that. And, and that's, so, so don't, don't, don't get me wrong, I'm not wanting here to be anti-science, and, and I'll, I'll make this point much clearer in the next lecture. 
but it is the case that there are a series of myths that have grown up around science that give it a particular status in relation to both progress and questions of religious belief. And I think those are the myths that need to be punctured. I'm not quite sure what, what your, was your second point that no one's ever proved that God exists? No, I'm not, I'm not trying to say that. But I mean, clearly people in the past have attempted to prove the existence of God. Um, what, what I would rather say is if we, look at these, if we look at these things in the historical context, what, what counts as a proof in the past is not what counts as a proof now. Um, and so the example I would use this afternoon is, is Anselm's famous ontological argu so-called argument for the existence of God. But when we read Anselm, actually, Anselm starts off in, in a process of meditation. He clearly already believes God exists. There's no problem about that. But the whole preamble is setting up the mind so that it's in a capacity to be able to perform uh, a certain kind of function that enables him to see that God exists. So, so part of my point here is that the religious traditions, although arguments for the existence of God are attached to them, they don't rest on that as their foundation. What they rest on are people's direct experience of the supernatural. And that's why these lectures are not about, let me assess the classical arguments for the existence of God. I, I have no interest in doing that whatsoever. What I am interested in doing is getting to see how Historical actors in the past understood how it is they came to believe in the deity. And Aristotle is a classic case here. We would look at Aristotle and, and as I say, read this as an analytic philosopher. It looks like a cosmological argument for the existence of God. It's not. What Aristotle is saying is when we experience the world, we understand, as it were, immediately, not as the basis of some inferential process, that the supernatural exists. And so... The arguments for the existence of God are really marginal to what I'm trying to say, which is that uh, religious experience traditionally has been about seeing the world in a particular kind of way, and we no longer, most of us, no longer see the world that way, and that's the puzzle. Why don't we? And one argument is, well, we're better than everyone else who saw it that way, I'm not convinced by that, and so that's the puzzle that I want to explore. Yeah, look, I mean, this, this, is, this is a good, a good point, Andrew. I mean, two, two things. I mean, Pascal famously makes a distinction between the, the God of the philosophers and the God of Abraham, Isaac, and, and, and Jacob. And in a way, that's the pa part of the kind of distinction that I was referring to in my response to the, the interesting question before. Um, so that's, that's, I think, part of it. And there's another, there's another story about, there's another, as some of you will know, an interesting story about things went horribly wrong with the, the medieval nominalists who kind of made God uh, a being on the level of other beings, right? And, and that this was the root of the, 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 the problem of modernity, that we now think God exists as Martin Percy exists, for example, or as this lectern exists. And that's really a fundamental mistake to make. And to be honest, I'm quite sympathetic to that argument. So again, you're right that it's, 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 it's part of our understanding the historical context of a tradition if we, be, 
believe we belong to a historical tradition, understanding and grasping it in the way it was grasped in the past is a key part of that. And the very concept of what, what it means to say God exists has changed. And some would say for the worse. Yeah, that's, that's a very good question, Bethany. I will talk about this in the next lecture. <laughs> so if I don't answer it satisfactorily, if you're here for the next lecture and I don't answer that satisfactorily, um, come back to me. But I, I mean, I, it's, it's a, the very interesting question is whether in order to recapture it, we have to move backwards or whether there's a way of moving, moving forwards. And I think this is one of the problems. Some, some of the classical treatments, I think to some extent Charles Taylor, but for those of you who know Brad Gregory's work about the unintended reformation. So, you know, one of the critiques of Brad Gregory's work is that he seems to suggest that you know, if we could just undo the reformation, everything would be lovely again. Now, that's an exaggeration, right? But it's the problem about you know, our nost whether this is just some nostalgic attempt to recapture something that, that maybe never really existed, right? Um, so that we have to be careful we don't construct myths about the past. But, but I, I, I do think that we are, and, and the, the language I'm going to use is not to do with lenses, but demythologizing. Um, and so wait till after the next lecture and see, how you, see what you think then. There could not be uh, a better segue, I think, into uh, coffee time. So thank you very much right. indeed, Peter. Thanks, Mark. Um, thank you.